Gastroesophageal reflux disease is a high yield topic for your USMLE and NBME exam. In this presentation, we will explore crucial key points for our approach to GERD, encompassing diagnostic test, management, and recognition of extraesophageal symptoms. A 45-year-old male complains of frequent heartburn and regurgitation of stomach contents. He describes the heartburn as a burning sensation in the chest after meals and at night. He often experiences a sour or acidic taste in his mouth and sometimes wakes up coughing due to the regurgitation. The symptoms have affected his quality of life, leading to discomfort at work and sleep disturbances. He has tried over-the-counter antacids and lifestyle modifications, including avoiding spicy and fatty foods, elevating the head of his bed, and eating smaller, more frequent meals. While these measures provided temporary relief, his symptoms have persisted prompting him to seek medical attention. What is the diagnosis? This patient has GERD, but how is GERD different from GER? GER refers to a physiologic reflux that occurs after eating. It's short-lived and rarely happens at night. This happens when the content from the stomach goes to the esophagus, and this is a minor condition and affects most people like you and I. GERD, on the other hand, is a condition that develops when the reflux causes significant symptoms. If left untreated, GERD can result in significant complications such as Barrett's esophagus and even esophageal malignancies. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is a condition where food and stomach acid flow back to the esophagus and throat. It is fairly common in the Western world with a 10 to 20% prevalence and strongly linked to obesity. The classic symptoms of GERD are heartburn and regurgitation, and these are the important buzzwords to remember in a clinical vignette. Heartburn is a burning sensation in the sternal area after eating, while regurgitation is a perception of the flow of gastric content into the mouth. A 45-year-old female presents to the emergency room with complaints of chest discomfort. She describes the discomfort as intermittent heaviness in the upper chest that is mainly occurs during physical activity, particularly when she walks. She reports taking an over-the-counter H2 blocker like ranitidine without experiencing any relief of her symptoms. Additionally, she smokes 10 cigarettes a day, her blood pressure is elevated, and her BMI is 38. What is the most appropriate next step in her evaluation? Would you order an EKG? Would you just start the patient on a protein pump inhibitor? Or would you refer her to a gastroenterologist for an upper endoscopy? Given the patient's symptoms, it is essential to consider both gastrointestinal and cardiac causes of the chest pain. An EKG should be performed as the initial step to assess for any cardiac abnormalities or ischemia. After ruling out a cardiac cause of chest pain, through an EKG result, an eight-week trial of PPI is initiated. This trial aims to address the possibility of GERD contributing to her symptoms. In this case, there are no alarming symptoms or specific indications for an upper endoscopy. The decision to proceed with an upper endoscopy can be revisited later if the PPI trial does not provide relief or if there are changes in her clinical presentation. Although it is essential to know the common symptoms of GERD, the atypical symptoms are commonly asked on your board exams. If the patient is a high risk of cardiovascular event and presents with chest pain, an EKG and a troponin level is recommended. GERD is one of the common etiologies of chronic cough, and chronic cough is defined as a cough of at least three months. The top three conditions highly tested in junior exams are upper airway syndrome, also known as post-nasal drip syndrome, cough variant asthma, and GERD. So if the patient presents with chronic cough, consider GERD as one of the differential diagnoses. Now, global sensation is also very high yield on your exam. This is typically when a patient reports a sensation of a lump over the upper chest. It is a diagnosis of exclusion, but has strong association with GERD. 
The best way to organize the costs of GERD is to break them down into three different categories. One is decreased resistance to reflux. Two, enhanced reflux potential. And third is decreased esophageal clearance. One example of decreased resistance to reflux is hiatal hernia. Hiatal hernia is when the upper part of the stomach herniates upward as shown to the left-hand side through an opening in the diaphragm. This decreases resistance to reflux. On the other hand, alcohol and smoking relax the lower esophageal sphincter, allowing more acid from the stomach to reflux to the esophagus. There are specific foods such as chocolate and medications that also relaxes the LES pressure. These medications that are highly tested in your exam include tricyclic antidepressants, opioids, nitrates, and calcium channel blockers, and therefore should be remembered before you take your exams. Obesity is strongly associated with GERD and may enhance reflux potential. It's the increase in the intragastric pressure below the diaphragm that affects the flow of food bolus from the mouth going down to the esophagus to the stomach, causing the reflux. And last is a condition that affects esophageal peristalsis that decreases esophageal clearance. Diffuse esophageal spasms is a good example. So why is GERD important? Untreated GERD can significantly impact a patient's well-being, leading to a lot of issues. It can disrupt one's sleep, reduce productivity, and even result in missed work days and even school days. If left unmanaged, GERD can progress to a more serious complications, such as erosive esophagitis. Erosive esophagitis is a chronic inflammation due to prolonged exposure to gastric contents, and this ultimately lead to formation of scar tissue around the esophageal tube. And this scarring can cause narrowing the esophagus resulting in esophageal strictures, and therefore, patient develop dysphagia, complaints of difficulty in swallowing. Now, if GERD remains untreated despite having all these symptoms, it can then progress to a condition called Barrett's esophagus, which in turn may increase the development of esophageal cancer. Let's revisit one of the cases discussed earlier. We determined that the 45-year-old male patient who complained of frequent heartburn and regurgitation has GERD and not GER. What is the most appropriate next step in management? Is it an upper endoscopy? Do we order a bare esophagram? Do we order an ambulatory pH testing? Or do we just start them on a proton pump inhibitor trial? The answer is a trial of PPI. Patients with GERD symptoms without alarming symptoms may try proton pump inhibitor as a diagnostic trial, plus lifestyle modification. Lifestyle modification includes weight loss, dietary adjustments, and avoiding smoking or drinking alcohol. The majority of patients with GERD will not require an upper endoscopy. However, an upper endoscopy is recommended if the patient has alarming findings such as dysphagia, unintended weight loss, vomiting blood, or black stools, and therefore very high yield key points for your exams. Pharmacological approaches to managing GERD encompass antacids, H2 blockers, and PPI therapy. Among these options, PPI therapy stands as the preferred choice for symptom relief and treatment of erosive esophagitis when prescribed once daily for an eight-week duration. PPI therapy exhibits superior efficacy compared to H2 blockers, regardless of whether its erosive esophagitis is present or not. To optimize effectiveness of PPIs, they should be taken 30 to 60 minutes before the first meal of the day. In cases where there's only a partial response to PPI therapy, an increase in dosage to twice daily may become necessary. For long-term maintenance therapy, it is advisable to use the lowest effective PPI dose. Nevertheless, it is crucial to acknowledge that extended PPI therapy is not suitable for all GERD patients. Those with uncomplicated GERD 
she consider attempting to taper or discontinue chronic PPI therapy for at least a year? So a 65-year-old male patient presents to your clinic. He has a two-year history of GERD, but denies experiencing any reflux symptoms since initiating a PPI treatment two years ago. Today, he is asking for a refill of his PPI medication. What is the most appropriate next step? Do you continue the PPI and provide him with another refill? Would you discontinue the PPI and start ranitidine, which is an H2 blocker? Or would you discontinue or reduce the dose of the PPI? In this case, the most appropriate course of action is to consider discontinuing the PPI or reducing it to the lowest effective dose. Long-term use of PPIs is primarily indicated for patients with conditions such as erosive esophagitis or Barrett's esophagus. If the patient has uncomplicated GERD, which means the patient does not have erosive esophagitis or Barrett's esophagus, then consider tapering the dose or even discontinuing the medication. Why is this important? PPI has side effects and you may encounter questions related to PPI side effects and therefore a high yield to remember. These include increased susceptibility to fractures, vitamin B12 deficiency, community-acquired pneumonia, and even C. diff infections. Upper endoscopy serves as the primary diagnostic tool for assessing the condition of the esophageal mucosa. It is highly recommended for patients exhibiting alarm symptoms such as dysphagia, unexplained weight loss, and atypical symptoms. Furthermore, it is advisable for individuals who do not respond to PPI therapy. Upper endoscopy is particularly indicated for patients reporting GERD symptoms combined with dysphagia, primarily to rule out structural issues or cancer. Additionally, it is recommended for those suspected of having erosive esophagitis, esophageal strictures, or Barrett's esophagus, providing valuable insights into their condition and guiding appropriate management strategies. Ambulatory pH monitoring is the gold standard test for GERD. It assesses esophageal acid exposure, especially in cases unresponsive to acid-reducing therapy, such as the PPI. It can either be a wired or a wireless approach. In this picture, you can see a monitoring device attached to a belt, and there is a wire from the monitoring device to the nose, through the esophagus, and to the gastroesophageal junction. At the end of this wire is a pH probe in the gastroesophageal junction, testing the pH of the gastric content in the esophagus. This is a wired ambulatory pH monitoring. A 48-hour wireless capsule requires an upper endoscopy. A wireless capsule is placed in the gastroesophageal junction. The patient is instructed to press a button in the monitoring device each time the patient has symptoms or eats specific food associated with reflux symptoms. The capsule sends a pH level to the monitoring device. A pH probe can only detect acidic fluid. An impedance testing is added with a pH probe to differentiate between acid and non-acid reflux. And therefore, an ablatory pH monitoring with impedance testing will determine if the patient's reflux symptoms are related to acid reflux, non-acid reflux, or not associated with any type of reflux. When confronted with a case of a patient who does not respond to PPI therapy, it is essential to explore the possibility of non-erosive reflux disease, also called NERD, or functional heartburn. To differentiate between NERD and a functional heartburn, an ambulatory pH monitoring with impedance testing is strongly recommended. In the case of NERD, while endoscopic examinations typically reveal no significant findings, Impedance pH monitoring can confirm the presence of non-acid reflux, helping establish the diagnosis. Functional heartburn, on the other hand, is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning it is considered at when other conditions have been ruled out through a thorough evaluation. Barrett's esophagus is a notable long-term complication of GERD, characterized by the transformation of the esophageal mucosa from squamous to intestinal columnar metaplasia. 
this condition is highly tested in your exam since it is associated with adenocarcinoma. During an endoscopy, the distinctive visual finding in Barrett's esophagus often appears as a salmon colored mucosal change. And it is very important to know what it looks like as this is a very high yield image that you will encounter on your exams. Biopsy plays a very crucial role in distinguishing Barrett's esophagus without dysplasia from those with low grade and high grade dysplasia. Understanding the surveillance and treatment of these conditions is significant in preparing for your board exams since it's also a very high yield topic for the USMLE and for the NBME. Barrett's esophagus without dysplasia necessitates EGD with biopsy every three to five years. In cases of Barrett's with low-grade dysplasia, EGD with biopsy should be conducted every six months to a year. Barrett's esophagus with high-grade dysplasia typically calls for an aggressive approach involving endoscopic mucosal resection and radiofrequency ablation as part of the treatment plan. So let's recap. What is the definition of chronic cough? It's a cough of at least three months. The symptom is constant or intermittent sensation of a lump or something stuck in the throat, globus sensation. What are the extraesophageal manifestations of GERD? Chronic cough, asthma, laryngitis, and globus sensation. What are the common medications known to relax the LES contributing to GERD? Tricyclic antidepressants, opioids, nitrates, and calcium channel blockers. What is the recommended intervention if a patient presents with dysphagia and GERD? Upper endoscopy. What is the gold standard test to diagnose GERD? Ambulatory pH and impedance monitoring. In conclusion, a comprehensive approach to GERD involves recognizing its significance, understanding its pathophysiology, considering risk factors, and assessing the clinical presentation. While lifestyle modifications are a foundational step in the management, pharmacological treatment options like PPI are often cornerstone of symptom relief. For more complex cases, particularly those involving alarm symptoms or complications like Barrett's esophagus, a thorough diagnostic evaluation including upper endoscopy and ambulatory pH monitoring is essential. Lastly, awareness of long-term complications and the need for surveillance in conditions such as Barrett's esophagus underscores the importance of a proactive and individualized approach to GERD management. We invite you to become part of our online community. Simply follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. There, you can access high-yield key points tailored to help you excel in your NBME and USMLE exams. Thank you, and take care.